Okay, so we're back. Uh, Bohr, and, uh, Bohr models and Lewis dot structures are two ways that we visually represent an element, okay, a, an individual atom. And uh, the reason it's important is because uh, the technology to see to the atomic level is out there. Um, we can do that sort of thing, but the detail is so fuzzy and hazy that it's much easier and much more useful to model it. All right. So a lot of times in science we use models because it helps us to, to use information, test information, and communicate in a more effective way. Anyway, so um, for Bohr models, Bohr models represent all of the electrons for a particular element, for a particular atom. Okay. So a Bohr model of hydrogen, for example, is the most simple because hydrogen is the lightest, most simple element that, that we have, okay? Um, and where did I set my marker? There it is. Um, hydrogen, symbol H. For a Bohr model, we just put the symbol in the center of the model, so we start off with the letter H. And um, with Bohr models, you you know, and, and with Lewis dot structures, we don't model the nuclei, okay? We don't, we don't represent the protons and the neutrons in any way other than to say there's the letter H, that means it's hydrogen, and then of course you can look up and you can say, all right, look, it's got, oh, not over there, over here, uh, it's got one as the atomic, man, uh, atomic number, which means it has one proton. Also, it says 1.00794 for atomic mass, which means normally it doesn't have a neutron. It's just a proton. Anyway, I digress. Uh, so the H represents the nu nucleus of hydrogen. And then the Bohr model shows all of the electrons in their correct energy levels, or energy shells, if you want to call it that, um, in orbits, right? Um, and what I don't want you to think, I don't want to, in your mind to get this image that electrons are orbiting the, the atomic nucleus of its particular atom in a nice orderly way uh, like the planets do around the sun. That's not how it works at all. Actually, it's, it's very difficult to pinpoint the location of an electron at any time because they're just pinging all over the place, okay? But they have a certain amount of energy, so we, we put them in energy levels, okay? So um, for hydrogen, it has one proton, and if it's not an ion, it's going to have one electron as well. Okay, and we'll get into the definition of ion later. But for right now, we're gonna we're going to model hydrogen as it is as a normal electron, or excuse me, as a normal element, normal atom, not an uh, ion, not an isotope of it, normal hydrogen. Okay, so we'd have hydrogen, and then we'd we'd put a ring around it to represent the energy level. I put one ring around hydrogen. Because there is only one energy level in normal, everyday, basic hydrogen. How do I know there's only one? Well, I can go to my periodic table. Hydrogen is in the first horizontal row. That also represents that it's got one energy level. Of course, there's only one electron, so there could only be one energy level, right? So then I'm just going to go ahead and place an electron at the top of that, okay? Um, when you get to high school or, or college, your chemistry teacher or professor might want you to, to put them in whatever kind of location they want. This is the way I'm teaching you um, for now. All right? So there's your hydrogen. Okay? If I wanted to do helium, if I want to do a Bohr model, by the way, Bohr model is spelled B-O-H-R. So, so don't say it's boring, uh, even though it can be at times. Uh, it's a different kind of Bohr. All right. Um, if I want to do hydrogen, I just change the H to HE because the, the symbol for helium is HE. And then what would I need to add? Another electron, right? Well, hopefully you weren't waiting for me to tell you. Hopefully when I pause like that, I'm waiting for you to think, all right? So I just put another electron up there because hydrogen has two electrons unless it's an ion, okay? which is less common more common with hydrogen. Anyway, um, so what would it look like for an element 
in the second horizontal row, okay? Right here, lithium through neon. So any of those are going to have two energy levels, and they'll all have those two uh, electrons that we had for hydrogen and helium, they'll still be there. That first energy level can only take two electrons. How do I know that? Well, look at my periodic table. I've got one, two uh, elements represented, and it also the layout also tells me that that first energy level can only take two electrons. So if I want this one to be, we'll go back to beryllium. If I want it to be beryllium, the symbol is Be. I'll have two electrons on my first energy level. How many electrons does beryllium have in total as long as it's just a normal plain Jane beryllium? Well, I've got, I'm pointing at the screen, you can't see that. I've got, I've got four uh, protons, and unless it's an ion, it'll also have four electrons. So if I've got two already on the inner energy level, I'll need two on the outer as well. And, and I've, I've gotten to the point where I really probably ought to just define ion, shouldn't I? Okay, so I'll write this down, an ion. I-O-N is an, an atom, an atom. Can you read that? Yeah, you can read that. An atom with fewer, uh, how should I say? I don't, that's, that's wordy. I want to keep the words down to a minute, all right? An atom with a different number of protons than electrons. Okay? So when we're doing a Bohr model of an element, and I say, hey, make me a Bohr, Bohr, a Bohr model of beryllium, uh, unless I tell you it's an ion and I tell you what charge it is, you're going to assume if it's not an ion, it must have the same number. Okay? If it's an ion, it has a different number of electrons and protons. If it's not an ion, then it has the same number of, of protons as electrons. Okay? So in this case with beryllium, if it's got four protons and it's not an ion, it would have four uh, electrons as well. So we'd have two in that first energy level, and we put the other two on the second energy level. Why do we have two energy levels? The periodic table shows that for us. Okay? And much more, uh, much smarter folks than I determined what that size and shape and, and where everything should go on the periodic table. So I don't have to know necessarily the whys and the hows. I just need to know how to use the table. Okay? So uh, if I was doing a, an atom in the third uh, period, the, the third horizontal row, all right, then I'd just, again, add... A, another energy level, another another ring on my model, and oh, by the way, I'd go ahead and fill up the last one. So to fill up the last one, I gotta know how many could it take. What's the maximum number of electrons this second uh, row could take? Well, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight elements in that second row. So that second energy level could take a maximum of eight. So I'm gonna go ahead and fill that up. So I already had two there. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. My wonderful drawing here. And then we just say, well, which, which one do we want to model? So I'm in the third row here. Let's say I want to model silicon. Okay? So silicon's uh, symbol is SI. SI for silicon. And then I need to know how many do I put on, how many electrons do I put on that outermost energy level? By the way, another word for that is the valence shell. The outermost shell of electrons for an element is called its valence shell. Think about what goes on the outside. Think about a bride on, on our wedding day. That veil in front of her face, that's the outermost thing. That's the same thing with, with uh, um, the elements. The outermost shell is called the valence electron. Okay? Um, well, silicon has... If you just follow across, that's, there's kind of this basic rule. You can count from left to right to figure out how many go in that outer shell. I've got one, two, three, four. And, oh, by the way, if I was curious, if I wasn't sure, I could also, I, I, I think I'm right, because I know that rule. I just now taught it to you. OK? 
down from left to right, skip the valley. Oh gosh, what's the valley? This little low spot right here. This right here. All, all the elements inside here, the transition elements, These I call this the valley. You got a hill over here, and you got a hill over here, right? So you count from left to right, trying to figure out how many balance electrons you have. So I, I counted one, two, three, four. So I put four, but I can double check that by saying, well, how many electrons should it have if it's not, if it's not an ion? Well, it's got 14 protons. If it's not an ion, it should also have 14 electrons. So 14, well, I already had two here in the first. And then I had eight. Two and eight makes 10. And I'm supposed to have 14. 10 out of 14 is four. See that? So I can confirm that rule. All right. Now, um, so that's how you'd, you'd model uh, any of them for the first three rows. OK? Uh, now, as you, you get into this fourth period, the, the rules, that, that hill and valley rule, really comes into, into play. Let me show you what I mean. So let's say. I want to make a Bohr model. I'm going to erase all of this so I have space and you guys have less to look at. Let's say I'm going to make a Bohr model of, oh, I don't know. Let's do germanium, GE, gera uh, geranium, germanium. All right. So uh, the atomic number is 32. If it's not an ion, and I haven't said it is, so it should also have the same number of electrons. So we'd have 32 electrons to model. So I just throw up the symbol, GE for geranium. Uh, germanium, I keep saying geranium. It's like a flower. Um, and then I need to know how many energy levels to put there. Well, again, how many orbits? But again, I've got one, two, three. It's in the fourth horizontal row. So I start off with the symbol, and then I put four rings around it. If you like it, put a ring on it, or in this case, four. One, two, three, four. Gorgeous, perfectly circular rings, because I always draw perfectly circular rings. OK, um, and now I work my way down. I say, well, the first energy level can only support two electrons. So right off the bat, I got two right there. OK, uh, the second uh, horizontal row here has Eight elements. So I'm going to have eight electrons represented there in the energy level. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now, the next row, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. But I'm not going to put that there yet. And it'll probably work out fine, but I'm going to teach you a little trick that'll keep you out of, tr out of trouble. You're going to go out. But you're, you're, you're get in the habit of not filling in the, the, the row before the valence level, that ring before the outermost. Go out to the outermost first using the rule, the rule I taught you. So I'm going to say count from left to right until you get to germanium and skip the valleys or pause in the valley. So I'm going to go one, two, 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 all the way across, three, four. Okay. I'm going to put four in that valence shell, that outermost shell. One, two, three, four. All right. Now I'm just going to add all of them up and subtract that number from 32 to tell me how many go in that next ring. So I've got 2 and 8 is 10, and then I have 4 in the outermost ring, which is 14. So I have 32 that are supposed to be on the model, and I have 14. Subtract that out, what do I get? Well, I can't take whatever. i got to borrow, right? Now I can take 4 out of 12, and I get 8, and I get 1 out of 2 is 1. So 18. 18. We're, 18. Good grief. You, you can't do that. You can't go over 8 in the valence shell. Well, it's not in the valence shell. We're hiding them just inside the valence shell. The valence shell on any element can take a maximum of 8 electrons, the outermost shell can take eight. The only exceptions are helium and hydrogen, because they can only take two Okay, in their valence shell. So um, so I'd have 18, and I'm not even going to draw the dots, because it's a little crazy. If you're doing a Bohr model for real, I'd want you to draw the dots. You'd have 18 of them up there. I'm going to put a number 18. Okay. Um, now, this periodic table, another one of the reasons I like it, 
is on the side, right over here. And you can't really make it out too well because the camera, you know, you're a little ways away. They put little numbers on the side here, and it tells you exactly how many electrons can go in each of those energy levels. It's a really cool periodic table. If you've got a periodic table that doesn't have that, I'd add that if I were you. Like, like if you still have a, an agenda from last year, um, put that in there. Or if you, if you uh, when we get into school, if we get new ones, put it in there. I'll remind you, um, hopefully. But so up here, the first one, there's only one energy level, so there's just a number two right here. The second row, there's two energy levels. You have two and a maximum of eight in the second. This third one has two, eight, and eight. Two, eight, and eight. But once you get down here, the numbers start getting a little crazy. Okay, So you could have a maximum for each energy level of two for the first energy level, eight for the second, 18 for the third, and eight for the fourth, which would be the valence shell. So this doesn't break any rules because it's not going over eight. It's got the four valence uh, electrons, and then all of the extras just get thrown back into that second most outer shell. Okay, and we can go more into that later. But that's the general rule right there, and some tricks on how to how to figure out how many uh, electrons are in the valence shell for constructing a Bohr model. And we've done several of them here. Uh, it looks like I'm at 16 minutes, so I should be able to get the Lewis dot structure portion in here, and we'll still be um, inside of 30 minutes. Hopefully, maybe 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 25. We'll see. So switching gears now. These were Bohr models, which represented all of the electrons in your ouch, in your uh, in your in your atom that you're dealing with in your element that you're dealing with. And you know what? I just decided I'm going to stop it here, um, so that if you want to look at Lewis dot structure versus Bohr model, you can flip back and forth, and you don't have to figure out where I stopped. So uh, a little too much explanation. I'll be right back with Lewis dot structure.